Now, as we come to the book of Proverbs, we are back in one of the books that we classify as the poetry of Scripture. You have Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. They belong in the same package as being written in what is known as Hebrew poetry. But the book of Proverbs is different from any other book. And Solomon is the writer, actually, not only of Proverbs, but of the next three books, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Now, Proverbs is the book on wisdom. Ecclesiastes is the book on folly, of foolishness. And the Song of Solomon is the book on love. And love is the happy medium between wisdom and folly. And believe me, this man Solomon was an expert on all three subjects. You can sure put it down that he was. In fact, doesn't the Word of God make it very clear that that is exactly what this man was an expert in? Let me read for you 1 Kings 4, 32 and 34. And he, that is, Solomon spake 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were a 1,005. Now, we have only one of his songs. He wrote a 1,005. And yet we have very few of his proverbs, to tell the truth. And we are told he spoke of trees from the cedar tree that's in Lebanon, even under the hyssop that springeth out of the wall. He spoke also of beasts and of fowl and of creeping things and of fishes. And there came of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from the kings of the earth, which had heard of his wisdom. Now, we're going to listen in this book to the wisdom of Solomon. Now, what is a proverb? Well, it's been called sententious sayings, for instance. And here is a definition I'd pass on to you. A proverb is a saying that conveys a specific truth in a pointed and pithy manner. Well, let me give you another one. Proverbs are short sentences drawn from long experience. And that's a good proverb itself. And it's a truth that's couched in a form that is easy to remember a philosophy based on experience, and a rule for conduct. A proverb, therefore, is a sententious sentence, a maxim, an old saying, an old saw, a bromide, or an epigram. Many of these things. Now, the key verse, I'd like to say, is found here in this first chapter, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now, there are some unusual features about the book of Proverbs I'd like to talk about today. The Orient and the ancient East are the home of Proverbs. I rather believe that Solomon gathered together many from other sources. He was the editor of all of them, and he's the author of some. And that means that what you have here is an inspired record of Proverbs that are either Solomon's or others, but God has put his stamp upon them. Dr. Thirtle and other scholars noted that there is a change of pronoun in the book from the second person to the third person. We'll note it, by the way, when we get to it. And the conclusions that these scholars came to was that the Proverbs with the second person were taught Solomon by his teachers, and the Proverbs with the third person were by Solomon. In other words, there is a difference, however, between the book of Proverbs and the Proverbs and other writings. For instance, the Greeks were great at making Proverbs, especially the Gnostic poets. I majored in Greek in college, and I took a course that was patterned after the Oxford plan. I just read a great deal of Greek and then reported to my professor, 
and he would have me read. I reported to him every Monday morning, and I read in the New Testament. In fact, I read the entire Testament through in Greek while I was in college. And then when I got to seminary, of course, we went over it again. But the Gnostic poets was one of the writings that I had to read in Greek. And believe me, they were great at making proverbs. And they were very clever when they were in the Greek language, because so many of them are a play upon Greek words. Now, there are some characteristics and features of the Proverbs that I think we should note. The first one is, Proverbs bear no unscientific statement or inaccurate observation. For instance, it says, Out of the heart proceed the issues of life. That's Proverbs 4, 23. It was about 2,700 years later that Harvey found that the blood circulates. In contrast, in an apocryphal book, the Epistle of Barnabas, mention is made of the mythological phoenix, a bird that consumes itself by fire and rises in resurrection. It's a fable such as this that does not appear in the book of Proverbs, nor anywhere in the Bible for that matter. It's strange that Of all these ancient records, here is a book that contains hundreds of Proverbs, and not one of them is unscientific today. You wouldn't find that in any other writing. That in and of itself ought to alert any thinking or intelligent person. Then the second thing is the Proverbs are on a high moral plane. The immoral sayings which occur in other writings, you just won't find them here. For instance, Justin Martyr said that Socrates was a Christian before Christ, which, of course, would be an impossibility. But actually, when you read Socrates, you find out that he portrays a high conception of morals according to his admirers. But Socrates also gives instructions to harlots on how to conduct themselves. Well, the best that you can say for him is that he was not moral, but unmoral. And then the book of Proverbs do not contradict themselves. They're not contradictory. A man's Proverbs today are often in opposition to each other. For instance, look at these. Look before you leap. And yet there's another proverb that says, he who hesitates is lost. And then there's a proverb that says a man gets no more than he pays for. And then another proverb says the best things in life are free. They contradict each other. And then there's a proverb that says leave well enough alone. But over against it, progress never stands still. And then there's another one, a rolling stone gathers no moss. But there's another proverb that says a setting hen does not get fat. So the Proverbs of man, they contradict each other. It's just owing to which one you want to use. Now, the book of Proverbs actually seemed to be a collection of sayings without any particular regard for orderly arrangement. You read them, you just think that, well, you've at last found a book in the Bible where you can lift out a verse and let it stand alone, put it in a frame and put it on the wall. I don't believe you can do that even with Proverbs. I think the book tells a story, and we'll notice this as we go through. Actually, it's the picture of a young man starting out in life, and he gets his first lesson in this very first chapter, verse 7. This is the key. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now we begin here with verse 8. Listen to this. My son, hear the instruction of thy father. Forsake not the law of thy mother. Now you will recall that back in Ephesians, in the sixth chapter, it opened with, Children, obey your parents in the law. This is right, they said. Now, here we have it again in the Old Testament, put in language like this. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. 
the little fellow is to start out as being one obedient to the parents. That's where life begins, by the way, and that's where important lessons are learned. Now, there are two schools that bid for this young man. You see, he grows up in the home. He's to listen to father and mother. They're his first teachers. In fact, the mom and dad are God to the little one. I've told this before, but I want to tell you that it made a great impression on me as a young preacher. We were coming across the country as during the war, and we wanted to get into California. I had an important engagement, and so we were driving at night. And we got down to Blythe, California, and we went in that the inspection station. And my, how lovely the man was there. The one in charge, he let my wife come in and heat the bottle for the baby, and she was able to feed her there. It was a cold night. We came back and got in the car and started out, and we just put her down between us. Didn't have seat belts in those days or a car seat for a child. We just put her down between us. And I never shall forget, it was a bad night, cold night, rainy night, and not too much traffic on the highway, but a narrow highway. And we started out, and she just sat right there, and before long she just went right off to sleep, leaning right up against her daddy. (laughs) She had utmost confidence in me. And I said at the time, O Lord, help me to trust you, my heavenly Father, just like she's trusting me. Now, when a child starts off in home, Mom and dad are just like God to the little one. But it's important that mom and dad act like God wants them to act. And so the little fellow sent to mom and dad here, My son, my son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. But wait a minute, wait a minute, Lord. Maybe mom and dad are not Christian. Maybe mom and dad won't bring the little fellow up right. God says, I'm going to hold them responsible. And may I say it to you today, God holds parents responsible for the condition of the little folk. And today, we've got a generation that didn't get the right training in the home, and they surely didn't get the right training in the school. And then we wonder today, as one man who has two hippie sons, he said to me, he says, God McGee, what's happening to young people today? I had to bite my tongue to keep from telling him. I said, you are what's happened to your own children. There's no question about that. Now, that doesn't mean that every parent has been a failure who has young people that have gotten away. A lot of them get away, but they come back to the Lord if they've been brought up right And you ought never be discouraged about that. Now, the book of Proverbs tells a story. And after the little fellow grows up, there are two schools that bid for the little fellow to come. They send out their catalog to him. They tell about the advantage of the school. One of the schools is known as the College of Wisdom. The other is known as the College for Fools. And by the way, they're two kinds of colleges today, and I'm not tempting to identify them. In chapter 8, we see the young man, he goes to the Academy of Wisdom, the College of Wisdom, and he's taught in Proverbs. And from chapter 10 through 24, the young man is in the classroom of wisdom. And this is a book that is especially helpful to young men. Many years ago, there was in Dallas a very prominent jeweler. And he was a very fine Christian. I knew him personally. I had him come down and speak to my church when I was pastor in Cleburne, Texas. And this man had the American Bible Society make up the book of Proverbs in a very attractive cover. In fact, it was gold-colored. Well, that would certainly be what a jeweler would want to do. And he sure had a very attractive one. And he literally gave out copies by the thousands to young men all across this country. He'd speak to a group of young men and YMCA's in that day. 
and in other places. And then he'd have a copy of the book of Proverbs given out. Well, the advice that's given in the book of Proverbs, it transcends all dispensation. Doesn't make any difference whether you're back in the Old Testament or in the New Testament or in the New Jerusalem or the Old Jerusalem. This book is a good book for anyone, the little book of Proverbs. I wish I could give it out today to every young man that's in the world today. It'd be wonderful. Nobody says, but there's nothing in there about the gospel. Wait a minute. We're going to find it here. The one in this book whose wisdom is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, at the end of the book of Proverbs, I'd want to make that clear. And that was made clear in the book that was given out. The book of Proverbs is not a hodgepodge of unrelated statements, nor is it a discourse of cabbages and kings. It is a book that makes sense, by the way, and it makes a whole lot of sense. And that is very definitely the way that it is arranged and organized. Solomon had something to say in this connection. Over in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 9, he says this, "...and moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge." Yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. So Solomon was teaching these here. Now, here you have a brief examination of the book which we're going to make. In spite of the fact it's a five-year program, we can't spend the time I'd love to spend in this book. I can highlight certain proverbs which we shall do. And it doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to pick out the most important or the most popular, but ones that we believe in this type of a ministry should be emphasized. And now here is something that will make the book of Proverbs a thrilling experience for you. There is a proverb that is a thumbnail sketch of every character in the Bible. And we're going to suggest a few of them. And here's the thing that makes it interesting. There is a proverb that will fit all your friends and all your acquaintances. Maybe if some of them, you better not give them the proverb that fits them. But I think there's a proverb that will fit every one of us, and we can have a good time going through this book. If as you read through, every now and then you'll come to a proverb, and immediately you'll think of Mr. So-and-so or Ms. So-and-so. And believe me, the proverb will fit them exactly. It's interesting that these proverbs should not only fit the characters in the Bible, but our friends and acquaintances today. And it'll show to us how really up-to-date the Word of God is. And that makes this a very interesting book. And it may not make you the most popular person to identify them publicly, but here they are. Now, Solomon wrote, 3,000 Proverbs. That's what we read back in 1 Kings 4.32. And we have less than 1,000 in this book. So you can see we don't have all the Proverbs. Now, the literary structure of the book of Proverbs, and I'll repeat this, that we gave back in the book of Psalms. And I think that we should give you this. The literary form of these Proverbs, it's in the form of couplets. And the two clauses of the couplet are generally related to each other. And it's termed parallelism. And that is Hebrew poetry. And there are three kinds of parallelism that you'll find in the book of Proverbs. What is known as synonymous parallelism. And the second clause restates what is given in the first clause in a little different way. Now, here's an example. Proverbs 19:29 Judgment are prepared for scorners and stripes for the back of fools. Now there's antithetic or contrast parallelism. And here a truth which is stated in the first clause is made stronger in the second clause by contrast with an opposite truth. Now listen to this. This is an example. Proverbs 13:9 The light of the righteous rejoiceth, 
but the lamp of the wicked shall be put out. You see it by contrast. And then there's synthetic parallelism. The second clause develops the thought of the first. Here you have it. The terror of a king is as the roaring of a lion. He that provoketh him to anger sinneth against his own life. And that's Proverbs 20, verse 2. It's a very remarkable book, you see. And we're going to see wisdom and folly contrasted in the first nine chapters. Then the Proverbs of Solomon, written and set in order by himself, 10 through 24. Proverbs of Solomon, set in order by men of Hezekiah, 25 to 29. Then Oracle of Agur, an unknown sage, chapter 30. And the Proverbs of a mother to Lemuel, and I believe that's Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, That's the last chapter, chapter 31. Now, friends, we come to the book of Proverbs, and I'm sure some of you, as you've begun reading in the book of Proverbs, you already are saying, my, I tell you, this is not a thrilling story that we're reading. Well, friends, it really is. I hope that we can get in step with the Spirit of God in this book, because it has a real message for each one of us. I think it's particularly slanted to young men today, and I think that would include young women also, because it has a message for youth in a very special way, because this is a day, as every day has been, when youth is looking for answers to the questions of life. Now, I want you to notice as we get into this book here how it opens, because it's not just a haphazard sort of thing, and it has a definite message as we go through. And I know that a great many people feel like you can just reach in here and take out a proverb, and I think it's all right to do that. But the point is, when we take it out and look at it, let's put it back where it belongs because the diamonds all belong in a setting here, and the setting is the book of Proverbs. You're inclined to read the book of Proverbs very much like the man said that he read the dictionary. He said, you know, I enjoy reading the dictionary, but he says the stories certainly are short. Well, maybe you feel that way about Proverbs, but I don't think it's quite that kind of a book. Now we have here, the way it opens, the Proverbs of Solomon the son of David, king of Israel. That really identifies the writer here at the beginning. And as we said before, that these first Proverbs he wrote, others he collected and put together, and then we find that others probably put together some more of Solomon's Proverbs. We are told he wrote more than we have here. Now, let me look at this first section here. Because what you have is wisdom and folly contrasted in the first nine chapters. And we see the boy here in chapter 1 in the home. He's starting out in life. And as he starts out in life, why, this is the advice. This is the instruction God gives to him. Now, will you notice what he says? The purpose is to know wisdom and instruction to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity, to give subtly to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion. Now, let's not pass over that hurriedly, because in this section here, there are ten words that are used that seem to be synonymous. And there, of course, is a relation but they're not the same words. I'd like to take each one of these words and put it under the microscope and look at it. And we'll find out that they're just not merely synonyms, and they are not given to us in order to pile up a very impressive beginning. Every word of God is pure, we're told. So let's look at some of these. The first one, to know wisdom. Now, what does he mean by wisdom? Well, as we've said time and time again, wisdom in Scripture, and this particular word here, it means the ability 
to use knowledge aright. And it occurs in this book alone 37 times. And it means to use knowledge aright. That's wisdom. A great many people, great many brilliant folk today, they have the knowledge, but they don't seem to have wisdom. They don't seem to be able to use it aright. Now, let me add something else here. Wisdom in the Old Testament for the believer today means Jesus Christ. We are told in 1 Corinthians, the very first chapter, in verse 30, "...but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption." And wisdom is number one. Christ is the wisdom for the believer today. And we need to know wisdom. And to know wisdom is to know Jesus Christ. Paul said that was the ambition, that I might know him. That was the ambition of the life of Paul the apostle. Oh, that that might be the thing that would grip your soul and my soul today. Oh, how we need it. I need it. You need it, I'm sure. The wisdom here, therefore, is Christ, and it is the ability to use knowledge aright. You know, to know Christ is not to play the fool. It's to be a wise man. And I saw a bumper sticker the other day. It says, wise men are still coming to him. (laughs) Well, you may not be smart when you come to him, but when you know him, you have wisdom. Now, The second word here is instruction, to know wisdom and instruction. Now, what is the word instruction? Well, it occurs here 26 times in Proverbs. And the very interesting thing is that sometimes this same Hebrew word is translated by the word chasten. And that's interesting. Let me just take one example of this. Over in the 24th verse of the 13th chapter. Will you notice this? He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Now, to chasten here actually means to give instruction. And therefore, this word instruction means you teach by discipline. Oh, that is something that's been lost sight of today. Now, if you want to know how out of kelter and out of step with the Word of God our contemporary society is today, we are told that the reason we put men in prison, it is to discipline them and to get them straightened out. May I say to you, that never was the purpose in the Word of God for dealing with criminals. The purpose is punishment, judgment. No other reason was ever given. Now, when you're dealing with a son, why you are to discipline him, because that's part of his instruction. You're to chasten him. And what does that mean? You are to teach him by disciplining him and not to punish him. And today we say the child should be punished. No, that's not the purpose. Why do you turn a little willy across your knee and paddle him? And I hope you do. Why do you paddle him? To punish him? No. To teach him by discipline. You see, we got the thing all mixed up today. And I think we need to get back to God's purpose, you see. God says that instruction is to teach by discipline. And by the way, I guess now that I'm retired, I'm an authority on about everything, so... I'm an authority now on the school system. And may I say this? I believe that today they are teaching, and they are talking about the new methods of teaching. How about the old method of teaching by discipline? That's absolutely out today in schools. And I think the Board of Education should be applied to the seat of knowledge. I think that that's desperately needed. It's needed in the home today. Man was asked, a father said, do you strike your children? Well, he says, only in self-defense. And it's come now that you bring up your parents the way that they should be brought up. 
and you discipline your parents today. I heard recently of a young man that went in and gave his mother and father a lecture on how they should be. And you know that he was then under a court order. He was under arrest and out on bail. And yet he's given them a lesson. Well, I think maybe the parents needed a lesson, but he wasn't the one to give the lesson, of course. You see, to teach by discipline, that's instruction. And our heavenly Father, our God, you know, he's good at teaching that way. I think most I've learned was when he took me to the woodshed, and those lessons were very impressive. Now, we have another one here to perceive the words of understanding. Now, understanding, well, it means intelligence. And we have another word today, discernment. We need to recognize that God expects us to use our intelligence. He expects us to use a great deal of sanctified common sense. These are wonderful words, you see. Now, we come down to another word here. To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. Now, we hear the instruction of wisdom. We've had that word. Justice is righteousness. And that means right behavior. I remember way back when I was in school, I had a sociology professor that always with a smirk would like to say, well, what is right? Well, I'll tell you what's right. I didn't know it then. But what God says is right. It's God that separates the light from the darkness. And God says it's good (laughs) to do a little separating of light and darkness. I can't make the sun come up and I can't make it go down. Only God is running the universe. He makes light. He makes darkness. God is the one who makes right, and God makes the wrong. You say, well, is it right to do this? It's right if God says so. Somebody says, is this wrong? It's wrong if God says so. Right and wrong are not relative terms, except in the minds of the contemporary, I would say, the contemporary average man believes that right and wrong is average. And that's one of the reasons that there's so much dishonesty today, gross immorality, because they say right and wrong are relative terms. God says they're not. They're just like light and darkness. Oh, these are wonderful words, justice and judgment. Now, that word judgment means that you and I make a judgment. I think it's the same as making a decision. In life today, the believer will come to a crossroad. And as we've said in teaching Philippians, however, in this course, we haven't yet come to Philippians, but in that epistle, Paul says you're to try the things that differ. Well, you get to a crossroad sometime. And which way are you to go? Should you go this way or that way? When I came to California, I had a call to the east. I had a call here to the west coast. And I honestly didn't know which way to go. And very frankly, had to go to the Lord, and I had to test out a few things. And when I made a test, I found out it was to come to California. And I thank God for it. May I say to you, we need to make decisions. You have to make decisions today as a child of God. Now, we come to another word here, an equity. Now, that refers to principles rather than to conduct. There are certain principles, and I don't think that the child of God's put under rules. I think we're under certain great principles today. And these are principles that should guide us. For instance, when we were studying Romans, you will recall I said there are three great principles, that we ought to have enthusiasm for what we do. I tell you, There's too much Christian conduct today that's done like walking on eggshells. I don't know whether I should do this or not. Well, my friend, I'll tell you this, and I don't care what it is. This is a principle. If you can't enter into it enthusiastically, you ought not to do it. A child of God ought to live it up, friends. Whatever we do, we ought to do with enthusiasm. We ought to be fully persuaded, Paul says. And then... 
We're also told that we ought not to, after we've done it, have a compunction of conscience. Happy is the man that his conscience doesn't condemn him in the things which he allows, you see. That is something today that a great many folk, my, they say, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. Well, you don't have to ask me. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he allows. That's a principle. That's not a rule. It's a principle. You put that down on anything. And if you can look back on what you did yesterday and say, hallelujah, it was a great day for me. I don't know what you did, but it was all right. (laughs) That's the principle, you see. And then there's another great principle. We ought to bear each other's infirmities, not please ourselves. And therefore, we ought to recognize, is this thing I'm doing, does it offend my neighbor? Does it offend my brother? These are great principles of conduct, friends, that should guide the believer. I spent a lot of time here. Now, notice the next one. We're told here to give subtlety to the simple. Now, what does he mean here? Well, I hear this used a great deal today on television. We ought to be prudent, and that's the word. That actually means that we ought to be wise in what we do. A child of God ought not to act very foolish. I know a young couple that went to the mission field. They just shut their eyes, as it were, and went to the mission field. I personally urged them not to go. Well, they came back casually, and they actually made shipwreck of their lives by going to the mission field. Why? They were not prudent. You should be wise in what you do. You remember the Lord Jesus says, wise as serpent, harmless as dove. Now, will you notice... To the young man, knowledge and discretion. Now, knowledge is information that's good for him. I remember in the science lab in the college I went to, that was in the bulletin, board this motto. Now, I've forgotten all the formulas I ever learned in chemistry, but I've never forgotten this. Next to knowing is knowing where to find out. That's the reason it's nice to have the Bible handy and learn to read it, because you don't know, you sure can know where to find out. The last word that's used here is discretion. Now, what does he mean by discretion? That means thoughtfulness. And this is for the young man, and generally, young people are thoughtless. I'm very frank to say I was a very thoughtless young man. Some think I'm still that way, but I forget so many things. But we should be thoughtful. How wonderful it is to find a thoughtful Christian. I have several very wonderful Christian friends here in Southern California. I'm getting ready right now to take a trip. I'm going back east. And it's been a little cool back there, apparently. And one of these friends came by and brought me a lovely sweater. (laughs) May I say to you, thoughtful. There's so many wonderful Christians, thoughtful. And that's a characteristic we ought to have. This book of Proverbs is going to help us with all these words, to have them incorporated into our lives. Now, will you notice, he moves on from that. He says, a wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. Now, a wise man will hear. That's been the characteristic of all great men, has been that they never reached the place where they felt like they had learned everything. I listened the other night to a young man on television. He's skyrocketed to fame in rock music. And the thing that characterized him was his arrogance. He knows it all. I don't think you could tell that young man anything. But a wise man will hear and he'll increase learning. A man of understanding shall attain to wise counsels. Now, that's the challenge as you enter this book. The thing that Solomon's going to say here is, if you're smart, you listen to what's being said in this book. Now, it's not to listen to me, friends, but it's to listen to what the Spirit of God has to say in the book of Proverbs. 
And you know, he has a lot of choice things to say in this book. They are great truths expressed in short sentences. Now he says, to understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. Now, there is in the Word of God a statement, and it's in the book of Proverbs. We'll be coming to it, and I love it. It says in verse 2 of chapter 25, it's the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. Now, God has given the gospel so clear to be declared from the housetop. But a great deal of the truth that's in the Word of God is not put on the surface like diamonds that would be scattered on the ground. God never's done that. He's always put the jewels and that which is valuable, he's always hid it away for man to find, the man to look for it. The gold has to be dug out of the ground, and the diamonds must be taken out of the ground. Other precious things must be mined, and oil must be drilled. Why? Because that's the thing that God does. It's the glory of God to conceal a thing. Now, the Word of God deserves all of the study that you possibly can bring to it. In other words, the Lord Jesus said, Search the Scriptures, for in them you think ye have eternal life. Now, he didn't say you're not to search them. What he really said is, Search the Scriptures. Now, you just think that you found it because you haven't searched it. You've been reading the Bible, but you haven't found the real treasure that is there. The real treasure that is there is Christ. Search the Scriptures. For in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which speak of me. Now, friends, if you haven't found Christ in the Bible, you just haven't been mining for diamonds. You haven't been digging deep enough. And that is the thing that he's saying here, to understand the proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. In other words, God has put these great truths here. And I would say the tragedy of the hour is the ignorance of the Word of God that's in both the pulpit and the pew. There needs to be a serious, concentrated study of the Word of God. This idea that you can read over a passage once and you've gotten it all. I trust that we've seen one thing in this study, that you just don't get it, friends, without study. I was down in Fort Myers, Florida. I always enjoy going down there and going out to the Edison home and his laboratory out there and the museum that is there. And the thing that amazes me and has amazed me in the past was in the laboratory he was looking for synthetic rubber and Firestone and Henry Ford had their homes right there next to Thomas A. Edison, and you can well understand why they would be interested. They were all working together. And Edison there, it looked to me like there were several hundreds of test tubes. You know what he was doing? He was taking everything that was imaginable and testing it to see if you couldn't get synthetic rubber from it. And you know where he found some of it? was in dandelions, of all things. That'd be the last place I'd look for synthetic rubber, would be in dandelions. And that was the test that he was making. And as I stood in that laboratory and looked at those hundreds of test tubes and thought of the hours that his helpers spent there testing this, that, and the other thing, in order to try to find this, I thought, my, how little attention is given to the Word of God where really you could do some real testing. You could do some real study. And today, the challenge of the book of Proverbs is this, dig in. The challenge here is study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 
This is a great challenge that's given to us. Now, the very key of the book, and I've mentioned this before, is verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And that's a very interesting one of contrast there. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. They do not learn from it at all. Experience never teaches a fool at all. But the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, I heard this little bit of nonsense. Maybe you've heard it before, but I think it illustrates a point. There was a man driving down the highway, and he had a flat. And he pulled over to the side of the road, and it was by an insane asylum where the insane were put. And there was a man over on the other side of the fence that came down in curiosity. He watched this man as he changed the tire. Never said anything to him, just stood there and looked at him. And the man didn't want to say anything to him. He didn't know the condition of the man that was in the institution. And so as he was changing the tire, he got the tire that was not punctured on, And then he had put all the nuts that he had taken off of the wheel in the hubcap, and he tilted it, and it went down in a sewer. And there were four or five of them down there, and he just stood there scratching his head. What in the world is he going to do? And the man back of the fence there in the insane institution, he said to him, says, Why don't you take a nut off each one of the other wheels and put it on that wheel and drive down to filling station and you'll be able to get others down there so that you can fix your wheel? And the man looked in amazement at this man. He says, why in the world didn't I think of that? You are in the institution and I'm out, and yet you're the one that thought of it. And the man says, I may be crazy but I'm not stupid. And friends, that's exactly what the book of Proverbs is attempting to do, is to get you and me out of the position of being stupid in life. Actually, this is a book that will help us, and we're going to hear quite a bit about that as we move even in this chapter. Now, let me move along. He says, "'My son, hear the instruction of thy father.'" Forsake not the law of thy mother. Now, that's for the home. That's the home relationship. We've already seen that. For they shall be an ornament of grace under thy head, chains about thy neck. How many are listening to me? They go back to a home where they had a godly father, godly mother that instructed them, and they never have gotten away from the things that they were taught in the home. God have mercy on a parent today who's not instructing the little one that's in the home in the things of God. Now, will you notice we begin to move out in another area. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Now you move out of the home. And who is the first fellow that you meet? Well, it's generally a sinner because most of the human race are sinners That is, they've not come to Christ. And all of us are sinners, but you'll meet the sinner who's really living in sin. Now, what's to be your attitude toward it? But by the way, you remember I said that in the book of Proverbs that you'll find a proverb for every character in the Bible. And you'll find, I think, a proverb for every friend of yours. And you might be well not to tell your friend what it is. Now, here's a proverb that refers to someone in the Scripture. Who do you think this applies to? My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Doesn't this apply to Joseph when he was taken as a slave down into the land of Egypt and Potiphar's wife attempted to entice him? Well, here is one that is an example of this, and he did not consent. Now, the... A little fellow brought up in the home. He's a young man. He moves out into life. Now, what is he going to do? Well, this is his problem. If sinners entice thee, 
consent thou not. What will happen? Well, here's what will happen. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Here he meets the sinner who has a plan and program to get something for nothing, to live off of somebody else and to make somebody suffer in order that he might prosper. Now the word is, cast in thy lot among us, is what they'll say. Let us all have one purse. That's an interesting thing, you see. That's the philosophy of the hour. Let's all of us live out of the same purse. And generally, those that are for that are for doing nothing themselves. They are for you and me sharing what we work for, and they haven't any contribution to make at all to it. This is a false philosophy of life, but it's a philosophy that's common among Young people, as they're coming along, unfortunately, this is the thinking and the mood of the present hour. Something for nothing. And using all kinds of methods to get it, even crooked methods and that sort of thing. I remember that when my dad was killed in a cotton gin accident, I was 14 years old, and my mother took my sister and me back to Nashville, her home, and I had to go to work. I couldn't continue in school because we had no finances at all. And I got a job at a wholesale hardware company, and they sold practically everything, including candy. And I worked in the mailing department with several boys. And I want to tell you, they were mean fellows. They had figured out a way that you could go into a box of candy and take out just one piece, and you'd never be detected. But it's wholesale there, and you'd have about 50 boxes. Well, you could fill up several yourself. And you know that, I must confess, I cooperated the first day. And then my conscience bothered me that night. And I said, that's not right. I'm stealing. And so I went back the next day and told them that I'd already eaten (laughs) several pieces. And I told them I was not for that. After that, they would let me buy it wholesale, and I would buy six bars of candy in a box, and I'd sell them a nickel a bar in the office there to the women that worked in the office and the men. And then I always kept the last one because I paid 25 cents for six bars. I sold them for a nickel apiece, so I got a bar. So that's the way I got my candy. I had to work for it, but I felt like that was the best way to do it. May I say to you that it's so easy to fall in with a group, especially a young man, to fall in with those that are shady and doing shady things, or working with a group that are goofing off, as they say, and are not returning a full day's work for a full day's wage. And it's so easy to cooperate in that type of a thing for the young man. Now, this is the first advice that's given to him when he leaves home. Now, he says, My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. And this is what I call separation. This is the kind of separation the Word of God is very clear on. Come ye out from among them and be separate. Well, that was concerning idolatry that Paul was talking about, but you can apply it right here. Solomon says, get rid of that crooked crowd that you're with, for their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the nets spread in the sight of any bird, and they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privily for their own lives. And when you get into that type of thing, it will eventually lead you to your own destruction. You'll be caught in your own net. Now, verse 19, So are the ways of every one that's greedy for gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. And this is condemnation at the beginning of covetousness. You and I live in a materialistic age. 
I have an article that's written by a Ph.D., a college professor, and he is taking a position that colleges must get away from the teaching of crass materialism, and therefore they must return to religion as he expresses it. May I say to you, there are a few that are beginning to wake up. Covetousness is the great sin of the hour, and that's what he's condemning here. Now he says, "'Wisdom crieth without, she uttereth her voice in the street.'" Wisdom is urging you to go to school and really learn something. Come to her college. She crieth in the chief places of concourse, in the opening of the gates in the city. She uttereth her words, saying, "'How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity?' And it is stupidity. "'How long will you be stupid?' A young man told me, he's in his 20s now, of how he'd been on drugs for three years. And he kept repeating this, oh, how stupid I was, Dr. McGee. Well, how long are you going to be stupid? Come to the school of wisdom. Fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I'll pour out my spirit unto you. I'll make known my words unto you. Now let me drop down here because our time is about up to verse 32. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them. It is spiritual suicide to turn from Christ. And the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. What an expression this is. I wonder if this could speak of our nation. We're an affluent society. We measure every man by his bank account the home he lives in, the car he drives. Are we enjoying the prosperity of fools? Are we living in a fool's paradise? Now, friends, we come to the second chapter of the book of Proverbs, and I trust by now that you understand that the book of Proverbs, it's not a haphazard book at all. It tells a story, and it's a connected story. We have the challenge given to a young man that he'd be a wise young man. He'll hear. He'll increase his learning. And that he is to start out in the home to learn from his father and his mother. And that the very basic lesson, in fact, it will be the one he gets in kindergarten. And then when he gets his Ph.D. degree, why, it'll be good for him there. And that is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, the way we find out about the Lord is in his word. Now, there are great many people are going to say that, after all, you have to be a very intelligent person. You must have a very high IQ in order to understand the word of God. Well, friends, nothing is farther from the truth than that. God does not say that that's the thing that is essential at all. But he does make it clear now in the second chapter, as this young man starts out, that if he is to know the will and word of God, it's going to mean that he'll have to study. And therefore, he just can't dilly-dally, and he can't pick daisies along the highway of life. He must apply his heart unto wisdom. And therefore, he must study the Word of God. Now, I want you to notice what he says here at the very beginning, how again and again and again he comes at this, speaking to this young man. Now, this is very important to see. He says here, verse 1, "...my son..." And we have said that this is advice given to a young man. Starts out a little boy in the home, he grows up now, and he's out facing life, and he's given this advice by some wise person along the way. Apparently, this was maybe his first lesson in school. I don't think he'd learn it today, but this is a lesson you could learn in school. Here it is, my son, if thou wilt receive my sayings. Now, notice the sayings of God are to be received. Now, notice the next, "...and lay up my commandments with thee." Now, that word lay up actually means hidden. Hide my commandments with thee. Lay them up. 
store them up. Put them where you put your valuables. I know a man that goes to his safety deposit box. They tell me regularly, that is once a week, just to count what he's got there. He loves to go over his wealth. He stored up bonds there, I guess, and stock, and he just likes to go and look it over. And I know a lady that she has quite a bit of jewelry, and she likes to take it out, and I think more than once a week, and look at it. She keeps it stored up. Now, the Word of God is to be laid up, or stored up, or hidden away like this. Lay up my commandments with thee. Now, verse 2, "...so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom." Listen, keep your ear open, "...and apply thy heart to understanding." Now, it's not something to go into the head, but it's through the ear gate, but it's to get down into the heart. And when you get to the heart of the matter, in the Word of God, it brings understanding. Now, notice here, he's still not through with this injunction, this urging, this challenge. Verse 3, Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, notice this. Peter puts it like this, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word. Have you ever seen a little baby when mama is fixing the bottle, a little fella's lying on his back, and he's wiggling everything he's got. Hands are going, and believe me, the mouth is going, the feet are going. I tell you, he desires the milk bottle. And the child of God should be that way, as far as the Word of God is concerned. That is the thing that I've noted about this present spiritual movement that is abroad today. Where you see it, there is a renewed interest in the Word of God. I notice many young people today bringing notebooks, Bibles, and they take down everything. I've been speaking around over the country in many places, and you can always tell when there's a real moving of the Spirit of God, it is evidenced in this desire for the Word of God. If thou criest after knowledge, the knowledge is what? The fear of the Lord, it's the beginning of it. And lift this up thy voice for understanding. Now, if you want to have a protest movement today in college, and I frankly would like to see this kind of a protest movement carried on this fall in college. I'd like these placards that they carry, I'd like for them to read, We want to be taught this semester. We want the professors to teach us something for a change. I tell you, I think that would be good. And I think it'd be nice if the professors would carry a banner and say, we want to teach this semester and not be giving out propaganda. We'd like to really get down to fundamentals and to learn something. And notice what he says here. You lift up your voice for understanding. And notice this. If thou seekest her as silver... Out here in the desert in California, there are quite a few silver mines. They tell stories about how in the early days men came all the way across the country. Many of them starved to death and up around Death Valley. And the reason they call it Death Valley was silver found up in that valley, in that area. And then many a man died trying to get to it. And then when they got there, they made all kinds of sacrifices. Thou seekest her as silver. My, that's the way we should go after knowledge, knowledge of the Word of God, and searches for her as for hid treasures. Just like you're out mining, looking for something valuable. Then shalt thou understand the fear of Jehovah and find the knowledge of God. Now let me come back and look at this for a moment. We are talking now about something that is not devotional reading. Now, many of you know that I do not go along for devotional reading because I know folk and families that have been at this for years, and they're as ignorant of the Bible as a goat grazing grass on the hillside. Why? 
Because that's not the way you learn the Word of God. The way you learn the Word of God is not to get in some pious frame of mind, read very piously a few verses of Scripture. This is the way you get at it. You lay it up. You incline your ear. You apply your heart. You cry after it. You lift up your voice. You seek it as silver. You search it like it's hidden treasure. Then when you start like that, you're going to learn something. You're going to understand what the fear of Jehovah is, and you're going to find out the knowledge of God. I get a little provoked. I used to teach Bible in the institute when we had an institute here in Southern California, and I had several hundred students in that. It's always amusing to me. Some very pious ones, the day before exam, they, oh my, they really were pious. Then on the morning of the exam, they would come up and say, Dr. McGee, we're not prepared to take the exam today. We had a prayer meeting last night. And I would always ask them, what would you pray about? Well, they prayed for China or for Africa or some far-off place. I said, you know, for you, the most important thing in the world last night was not to pray. Oh, they looked at me in amazement. You mean not to pray? I said, right. There's a time to study. And I gave them always this second chapter of Proverbs. I says, there's nothing in there about praying, but there's a whole lot about digging it out, about searching for it, about crying for it, all of that. To learn the Word of God. And I said, that's why you are here, is to learn the Word of God. And I said, you get back there and take that examination. You're not going to give me that kind of an excuse. And you know, they always failed. (laughs) They never passed it like that. And then there were others that thought that you did this in a very pious way. I think they'd been brought up on devotional reading. And they would, as it were, read a few verses and then put the Bible under their pillow. And I used to tell them, you can't learn the kings of Israel and Judah by sticking your Bible under your pillow and expecting it during the night that that knowledge will come up through the duck feathers into your brain. You don't get it that way. I remember a fellow in class was talking about a pretty hard test that we had coming up in seminary. And it was on theology. And it was on a certain book. And it was a pretty boring book. As far as I'm concerned, it certainly wasn't like a mystery story. And one of the boys was complaining. He says, Doctor, this is the driest book I've ever read. And the professor said, well, then dampen it with a little sweat of your brow. That will liven it up. And that is the thing that God says that there's no hocus-pocus way of learning the Word of God. There's no pious way of learning it. There is no substitute for just digging it out. And you really don't have to have an IQ. Why? Notice what he says in verse 6. For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. If you want wisdom, you go ask him. (laughs) You remember, I have not seen, ear heard. It hasn't entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them that love. But what has happened? But they are revealed to us how by the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit today is here to be our teacher. That to me was the most wonderful thing I came in contact with as a young Christian. That the Spirit of God would open these things. God hath revealed them unto us by Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, the deep things of God. And you know that's the reason that today there are some folk that they don't have a Ph.D. or a Th.D. They're not doctor. Their theology hasn't been doctored at all. But they have a knowledge of the Word of God that others do not have. I've told a little story about a little country woman way up in Denison, Texas. And I'll not tell that one again, but I've got several because I've come across these people in my ministry When I first went to Nashville, Tennessee, I tried to get interest in a Bible conference, and we did get quite a bit of interest. And then there was a morning program that they turned over to the ministers. Well, none of these other ministers wanted it because you 
had to get up at six o'clock in the morning to conduct it. I was single then, and I have always waked up early. I worked on a newspaper when I was in college, so I'd wake up early, and I agreed to take it. I wanted to take it. And I want to be very frank with you. I tried to teach the Word of God, but nobody seemed to be interested in it except one person. You know who it was? It was a black lady that used to pass my church every morning. And I would be out sometimes at the bulletin board changing the subject, and she'd come by on the way to work. And she'd say, Mr. McGee, I heard you this morning. And I always made me feel good to know somebody was listening. And she said, you know what you said? And then we'd discuss it. And she had a real spiritual discernment. Now, she told me that she only finished grade school. But I'm here to tell you that that wonderful black Christian knew more theology than the average Christian in any church in that city in that day that I came in contact with. She really knew how to discuss the Word of God. And you know how she learned it? The Lord giveth wisdom. And she had a Bible. She showed it to me one day. And I've never seen a Bible that was worn as much as that Bible was. She used it. She read it. She understood it. Why? She's willing for the Spirit of God to teach her. Now, we're living in a day when there's not this interest. I'm amazed that there's many people want to study the Bible with us. I've just been thrilled by it because I was rather pessimistic. I had come to the conclusion there weren't really many people that really wanted to study the Word of God. Now, even Dr. Ironside in his day noted that, and here's a statement he made at that time many years ago. He says, "...it's to be feared that even among those who hold and value much precious truth, diligent Bible study is on the wane." I'm afraid that is true. And that's the reason we invite you to send in for notes and outlines because we believe God wants to teach us today. And he's teaching a great many folk. And that's one of the greatest thrills of my ministry. And very frankly, he's teaching me too. Oh, how wonderful it is. And I feel like I'm still in the primer. Now, notice this again, verse 6. For Jehovah giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Now, where do you hear him speaking? In his word. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He's a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. One of the reasons that so many Christians are out in the fog and they're in the darkness, and they wonder where to turn. My friend, it's obvious what the problem is. They're so far from the word of God. Here's where he's speaking. This is the foghorn right here, the Word of God. And he preserveth the way of his saints. That's what he'll do. And he just doesn't do it haphazardly. You'll have to come to the Word of God. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. Now today, it's a sad day to see so many men in public office that are guiding the destiny of nations that are not being guided by the Lord today, and he wants to guide them. Oh, if they'd only go to him for wisdom, he wants to guide them. Where there is a single eye and a true heart that is characterized by a real deep-down desire to live in the power of the truth revealed here in the Word of God to the soul of man, may I say that God at that time, he'll be a buckler. He'll be a defense for his own, keeping them safely as they tread the paths of judgment, thus preserving their way. Oh, my friend, I hear a great many people every now and then. Somebody writes me a letter and says, I see that you hold the truth. Well, wait a minute. Now, I like that. Don't misunderstand. That's fine. But that's not the important thing. I want the truth to hold me. (laughs) That's the important thing. 
that the truth hold us. You see, there's a big difference between those. We are told that in the last days there'd be vain talkers and deceivers. I don't want to be one of those. I hope I'm not. I do not want to use great swelling words. I don't want to boast of a great knowledge of prophecy and dispensational teaching and ecclesiastical truth and philosophy and psychology. Oh, my friend, (laughs) there's too much of that around today. May I say to you, we need to have this kind of an attitude. Notice now verse 10 here. When wisdom entereth into thy heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee, to deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh forward things. You won't be taken in, easy, friends. You stay close to the word of God. Verse 13, "...who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice to do evil and delight in the frowardness of the evil one, whose ways are crooked and perverse in their ways." That's been my prayer from the very beginning in my ministry. Oh, God, don't let me be taken in by evil men. They're around us today. And you're going to find in this book here that the child of God has two enemies. And the two enemies, one's the evil man and the other's the strange woman. There were two warnings given to the young man as he started out in life. One was of the evil man, the evil man, and the danger of associating with him and of walking with him. That's always a problem for a young man. I ran away when I say ran away. My father died. Nobody was going to hinder me. But when I was about 16 years old, I went to Detroit, Michigan to work for the automobile industry. I didn't work for Henry Ford because, well, a Ford car didn't impress me too much. I went over and worked for Cadillac. And you probably have wondered why the Cadillac automobile is considered such a fine car. Well, it's because I worked there for a few months. Well, I got in with a wrong crowd, I can assure you. Bootleg days go over every Saturday night to Windsor, Canada. And I never shall forget that as a boy, I was introduced to a new world. I was with evil men. And thank God, they made me homesick. And as a teenage boy, I finally, after a few weeks of that, and under conviction every minute of the day and night, I went home. And there's where a minister explained to me, how you could have peace with God, being justified by faith. And I never shall forget that. The evil man. The young man should beware of him. And then there's someone else. The strange woman. Now, the better translation would be stranger woman. Verse 16, it says, "...to deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger which flattereth with her word." Now, who is the strange woman? Well, in Israel, God made a law that no Israelite woman was to play the prostitute. And I'm confident when anyone did that, that they were automatically put outside of the bounds of Israel. They were just as bad as a publican in the later years, and they were put outside and classed with sinners. But the stranger was the Gentile that came in. She recognized that there'd be a place to ply her trade, and the prostitutes came in, and they were generally foreigners. They were the strangers that came in. Now, the young man is warned about her, and he's told here what might happen to him. It says, "...none that go under her return again." Neither take they hold of the paths of life. They'll lose their health. I had a very fine elder in a church back east. He told me that the thing that almost wrecked his life, he says, just one escapade. He said, I went out on the town one night with the boys. 
And he says, that one night I picked up a venereal disease. And he said, I was years, and that was back in the old days, getting rid of it. And as a result, he says, it almost wrecked my life. God warns against that. And right now in our contemporary culture, in which we're living today, in this new morality, which is old immorality, we find that venereal diseases are actually in epidemic situation here in Southern California, so we're told. And I remember that as a young man, again, running around with a crowd of fellows, and we were in a certain organization where the leader of it was a very fine doctor. And I never shall forget, he saw that there were several of us doing a great deal of running around, and he called us in and said he just wanted to have a friendly talk with us. Well, he scared the daylights out of me, but somebody says, oh, I don't think we ought to frighten these young people today. May I say to you, I thank God that he scared me. Oh, I was scared and frightened at the things that he told us. And may I say that that's exactly what the writer here to the Proverbs is doing. The evil man and the evil woman, let's say, but she's called a stranger here. 